Hello, I'm Dr. Ruth Roberts, your pet's ally. Glad you guys are able to get here today and hopefully I can answer some questions for you. So my topic is, why is it all of a sudden grain-free foods are evil incarnate? So, you know, a year ago they were like the best thing since sliced bread because grains are evil. And then fat was evil. And then meat was evil. So, you know, so what is it? Here's part of the thing. There's a lot of stuff going on in human nutrition right now that is fad-based. It's something that worked for somebody so it becomes a movement because it's important now for that person to sort of get their word out, but also, you know, have others support them. And so it's really, really difficult. So I'm going to put a couple of links in here. Uh, one is to the FDA report on a mentary balance. There's the FDA report on the grain-free foods. And here's a blog post we did a little while ago. Let's see if I'm smart enough to do this about why is it so hard to feed my pet a healthy diet. So uh, here's the thing that <laughs> that I think happened with grain-free foods. And I'm going to kind of circle back to the trendy idea. So theoretically, dogs can make taurine as long as there's a sufficient amount of other amino acids available. And certainly beans, uh, and so back up one more step further, beans are used in uh, grain-free foods as a starch. So you're going to see things like garbanzo beans and uh, peas and uh, some potatoes and a few other bits and pieces. But the, um, the deal is, is that it's still in the balance of what AFCO thinks is good, which is something like 65 to 70 percent carbohydrate. Well, there's not too many of us that eat that sort of diet very well. Um, you know, if you're vegan, it's very difficult to get all of your protein uh, unless you're using combination proteins with, so beans or uh, corn, you know, corn, bean and co corn combo, sorry, beans and rice, those make complete proteins, meaning that there's sufficient uh, amino acids available to allow us humans to create uh, proteins that make our muscles and, re you know, repair our bodies and things of that nature. So in these grain-free foods, they are always like 65 to 70 percent or more carbohydrate source. Now there's, you know, in our crock pet chefs community, there's been this, you know, ranging debate about, you know, peas being evil because they're inflammatory and this and that and the other. And here's the deal. At 65 to 70 percent carbohydrate source, beans and peas contain anti-nutrients called lectins. And in reasonable quantities, and if they are cooked properly, this is not a big deal. However, when you're feeding 70% of the diet of these, of these substances, there are sufficient anti-nutrient Pres anti-nutrients present to inhibit the absorption of other nutrients. And this is what I think is happening. And I have to agree that this dilative cardiomyopathy issue is multifaceted because it, uh, because they are mostly in golden retrievers. If you look at that report, it's mostly golden retrievers and then mixed breed and then a few others that tend to have heart issues. Goldies have this really peculiar genome going on and unfortunately uh, it has made them the target for many diseases including cancer. So it is really frustrating. So again, the FDA has still not decided what has caused the issues. Um, but, you know, here it is. So what do you do? Don't follow the trend. Think about what's reasonable. So for instance, in my frustration, in all of the health issues I've had, I actually considered doing the carnivore diet, which is all meat. And it, 
And the reason I considered it was because I was having so much pain, so much difficulty that it's like, I'll do anything. And I had already done a lot. Like at, at one point I was down to eating soup for about, oh, six months. And I gotta tell you, I don't like soup very much. And all I could eat were six vegetables, which really was not fun, and, um, and meats, you know, lamb, uh, chicken didn't do it for me, so lamb and beef. I couldn't eat pork either. So it was just like duck periodically. It was just really boring. Um, and was it balanced? Probably not. So that's what happens is that there's these diet fads that happen and they get everybody all flipped out. And unfortunately, what ends up happening is that we suffer and our pets suffer because we're not eating reasonably and we are not eating intuitively. So here is what's kind of my line of reasoning. The other thing is, is that raw feeding is the main thing that most holistic vets are going to recommend. And many of them will call me an idiot and a charlatan because I don't. But here's why I don't. Um, dogs evolved with us eating our garbage. So to give you some frame of reference, around 30, 50,000 years ago, Neanderthals and us, Homo sapiens, had fire. We were already cooking. Canis familiaris showed up around 30,000 years ago. And did they evolve from wolves or did they evolve from another progenitor species? I think right now the camp is back to they evolved from wolves, but they aren't wolves. They evolved eating our garbage. And then we decided they were really good hunting partners. And this is a theory about why the Neanderthals disappeared because we went to war with our new pal, Canis familiaris, and killed them all. Um, that's pretty human-esque, right? Uh, so the thing is, is that they, once they became our hunting partners, we also fed them. And we'd feed them little tidbits from the kill and from the butchering process, but the vast majority of what they were eating is what was cooked. Well, our leftovers, and then finally what we fed them specifically. And this is where the balance, like if you go back and look at Juliette Barclay-Levy, who wrote uh, something, like, I think the book is called Natural Rearing for Dogs. And this was written a long time ago. And she was basing it off of how dogs were eating when she grew up. So milk, you know, so it's all the leftovers. What can we, what do we need to get rid of before it spoils? And what do we need to balance their diet? So they were eating a lot in England, milk, oats, things like that, and some proteins. They weren't eating raw. She does talk about raw here and there, but a lot of it was already cooked. So, you know, so that's the deal with dogs. Cats truly are obligate carnivores, but we have mucked up their digestive systems and their taste buds to the point where they are little carb addicts. And so getting a cat to actually eat even the crock pet diet is a major challenge because it is, it's not sweet. It doesn't have that sugar kick. And their little brains are responding to that glucose kick much the way that ours does. Um, so that's the issue with cats. If you can get them to actually, uh, you know, eat some, uh, um, you know, some more veggies or just plain protein, you're really doing well. So that's one reason. I really do not believe that raw is the ancestral diet of dogs. Cats, there was a woman that actually invented a truly a mouse in a can diet and because of the ick factor, it never took off. But that's really what cats should be eating. Eh, doesn't happen very much. Uh, and then I always like to tell the story about my cats trying raw diet. They've been eating cooked now, mind you, for a, over a year. And so I decide, okay, I'll try this for them. So I give them all a little bit, a little spoonful um, next to their food, which they all happily ate. And then five minutes later, all five of them projectile vomited across the room. And so that's kind of my other point. Raw food is cold and damp. And in Chinese medicine, the spleen, which is considered to be the main digestive organ, abhors raw, uh, cold and damp. So that's, a, that's one of the other reasons I don't really go for raw. Now, what I'm gonna tell you is that that cooked food is what works the best in my hands for the majority of patients that I treat. 
However, there are patients that do better on raw. So this is when, again, you have to look at your dog. You have to look at what's going on. Is this working? Is it not working? Can we make it better? Can, is that is the thing we tried making it worse? These are all things you gotta you gotta work on here. So um, pay attention to what your pet is telling you. Now the other thing that I want to put out there is that um, the sustainability issue of raw. So currently, dogs and cats are eating 25 to 30 percent of the meat produced in the United States which is a shocking number. And if meat, if cattle production is our number one greenhouse gas uh, contributor, actually more than automobiles theoretically, although the science gets a little mucky around that, um, then maybe it's not a good idea to try to convert every dog and cat to raw, aside from the other reasons I just mentioned. And then lastly, most veterinarians are going to tell you not to feed raw because of the food contamination issue. Now, the fact is, is that you are much more likely to get food poisoning, i.e. salmonella, listeriosis, campylobacterosis, all of those things from feeding the bag of food than from feeding raw. In fact, the FDA, over a decade ago said, after you scoop your pet's food out of the bag, wash your hands. Okay, now the FDA targeted raw diets two years ago and they've since let up and I think they're just looking at pet treats now because of the contaminants coming in on these items from China. So, you know, it's all just a matter of who's gonna decide to do what. What are we going to persecute today? What's freaking us out today? And as many of you have mentioned in the comments, there's no balance here. So think about what balance is and try to execute that for your pet. In my mind, balance for dogs in particular is going to be pretty close to the way humans, the vast majority of us, ought to eat. And so that's going to be things like a 30, one third split between the macronutrients, protein, fat, carbohydrate. And in the carbohydrates are both simple, meaning starchy or high sugar converting carbohydrates like rice, potatoes, um, beans, things of that nature. And there's gonna be vegetables. So the other comment I'm gonna put out there about beans is I do include them in my diet. And it's not for every dog or cat, but for most animals, it works well. Now, they're also in the appropriate ratio. They're not occupying more than, say, 15% of the diet. And the other upside about beans is they are considered to be what's called a slow carb, meaning that the fiber that is present in the bean pre prevents you from taking a massive glucose hit from eating that starchy thing versus what, uh, you know, versus rice and things of that nature. So that's kind of my, my deal there. The deal is too, is why worry about what's going on if you cook the safest and healthiest diet on the planet for your pet and you can customize it to exactly what they need. So that's why I created the original crock pet diet the way that I did. And it is to give you the flexibility to keep things in balance without, uh, by manipulating ingredients, like if your dog doesn't do well with beans and it has GI disease, we've got recipes that don't include beans. If you are considering a keto diet because your dog is uh, has cancer or diabetes, we've got recipes for that that are also in balance. And I worked with a board of nutrition to balance them to make them complete and balanced for all life stages according to AFCO officials, which is interesting. They've at least gone from um, minimum nutritional requirements to, to the mid-range, which I think is reasonable. So if you would like some help putting a diet together for your pet and figuring out how to solve health issues 
um, I would love to do that with you. And I do consultations and can design diets for you as well as a supplement program. And right now through the end of the month, um, we'll add on some free holistic total body support, which is the multivitamin I use to help keep the diet balanced. Uh, you can get um, 12 of those jars if you purchase the advanced care package for free and six jars if you purchase the optimal care package uh, also for free and choose dog or cat depending on what you've got. So in a couple of minutes we're going to go over to um, the crock pet cooks page and if you've purchased the original crock pet diet or if you have um, uh, if you have uh, done a consultation with me, things like that, you you can be a member of our private group. And so this is every morning I do the broadcast, every Monday morning I should say, do the broadcast here on the main page and then go over to the private group to answer more um, personalized questions. And so, and you guys have a ton of questions in here today. So here's the group link. If you are not a member today, it may take me a little bit to get you uh, approved just because of the in um, of what's going on here. And so I'm going to run back through here and make sure I didn't answer, miss any questions that are kind of relevant to here. Um, and you guys, you know, Terry, you're pointing it out absolutely correctly. There's this concept of balance and not these wild swings. Um, and Lily, glad you're enjoying the new time. And Ilsa is asking about her cat Stanley um, and cleaning the teeth. Uh, Ilsa, this is probably better answered in more detail via via a conversation and I think you and Melody were having some issues but I'll, I'll get you a scheduling link um, or she was having some issues so um, the convenia is the easiest way to go but I think a better and for a cat that may be the only thing you can do um, that's where using uh, it's an antibiotic injection you can also do cold laser therapy over the mouth and that's even safer than giving antibiotics but a better one would be um, clindamycin if you are able to get the uh, get that down I'm on a twice daily basis so you know and as many of you said there's just not a good way to you just have to look at your pet and figure out what's working well for them and Chad's asking if there's a crock pet diet for a puppy that's five months. Um, and yeah, the crock pet diet is complete and balanced for all life stages. For a puppy, you're probably going to need to feed more. Uh, and Chad, that's a, that's a hot mess if you've got allergies in a five month old puppy. Most likely it is food sensitivity, so that's the good news. Um, so that's what I've got. And Lily, yes, the Holistic Total Body Support is still on sale. Um, I'm in the process of reformulating the, um, the product now. And um, when it comes back in in January or so, we will have a larger size so we won't have all these tiny little uh, jars to go through. And thanks, Chad, for the kind comment on, on your lab. Um, I know you had a, had a rough road at the end of the day. So ladies and gentlemen, that's what I have for you today. We're going to jump over to the Facebook group in about 10 minutes. Um, but here's what I want you to remember. You're going to, and what we're going to discuss over there is calcium because it is profoundly and confusing the way that the, that AFCO presents nutritional requirements and the way that the NRC presents nutritional requirements. For instance, AFCOs are different than the NRC, even though in National Research Council, even though the NRC actually has them science-based because AFCO is trying to please the pet food manufacturers. And so they will allow food colors that will take the iron content way higher than it should be. So there you go. Um, there's, there's the, the uh, lobbyists influence or the influence of corporations on what you are given to feed your pet. Um, 
So that's what I have for you today. Remember, take everything you read with a grain of salt and uh, see if it works or it doesn't work in your pet. Uh, we we t again we're going we're doing so many fads and it's just insane that uh, people are eating you know just like mostly coconut oil if they're doing keto and it, it just it doesn't make any sense and eventually we will end up uh, depleting resources so for instance that's why I don't recommend krill oil once that became a popular supplement something like 30 percent of the biomass of krill. Uh, off the coast of Greenland was depleted. And for those of you that, that kind of don't know about this, krill are the, you know, that's what starts the whole food chain in the ocean. So if there aren't enough of those guys going around, what happens? There's, it, you know, we end up with depletion of species from the bottom up because there's just not enough food to eat. And that's a whole nother bag of wax and that's my, my limited expertise. So, until next week, take everything you read with a grain of salt, and by the way, you should probably eat more salt than you think, um, and remember, your pet's best health starts in the bowl. I'm Dr. Ruth Roberts, your pet's ally.